Hey, there he is. Ladies and gentlemen, Zach Foster joins us today on Adam versus the Man. A man of many talents. I don't know where he's coming to us from today. We're going to hear an update on all of his work with the Libertarian Party of Venezuela and Cuba. And I'm particularly excited to check in with him. He's an old friend of mine. We have been working together, supporting each other's messages for years. I've always been happy to lend him my platform because of the work that he's doing as an ambassador for the Libertarian Parties of Cuba and Venezuela. But I'm especially interested to check in with him now in light of the international crises that we find ourselves in, not just with the coronavirus, but even the protests around George Floyd going international and all of the things that we see going into elections in 2020. So, Zach, where are you joining us from today? I'm joining you guys from a bunker in La La Land, Southern <laughs> California. Oh, but how are the riots treating you in, in Los Angeles? <laughs> Uh, personally, I've only been mildly inconvenienced. I got to say the, the protests themselves are, are fully legitimate, but there's those, uh, little shitheads that have tried attaching themselves to those protests. So, um, I don't mind them blocking streets so much as long as they stay mobile. And for the most part, the protests have stayed mobile and that's okay. But, uh, yeah, I've still seen people try to throw rocks at cars. People try to throw rocks in my car. Uh, you know, I understand that they want to express, uh, some of these people want to express their anger, but, uh, like, dude, not in my car, not in my car. All right, Black Lives Matter and leave my damn car alone. Like, that's that's a fundamental universal quantum truth. Black Lives Matter and <laughs> leave my damn property alone, please. Thank you. Well, well unless but, you're uh, a cop. Other than the curfew, your property, I mean, right? Say again? Unless you're a cop and it's not really your property, right? Oh, there you go. Well, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to take the Fourth Amendment a little bit more seriously <laughs> than people, but, uh, you know, not everybody agrees with me. Yeah, no, I, I just I just want to point out that for the, the, the there are different degrees. Like I don't I don't I mean I support the message of the protests, the sentiment, and and the cause entirely. Um, I, I support anybody peacefully expressing themselves. Uh, I still don't I don't I don't support the protests in in a material way. I don't think they're productive. Uh, I think even even the expression of anger that we see, while entirely righteous and legitimate, is just creating more conflict and the excuse for government to grow the, the the justification anytime you give police an excuse to come out and riot gear or the national guard they get to justify their next year's budgets right yeah that's one of the negative consequences <clears throat> and it's really a mixed bag there is certainly a, a place i consider myself a radical politically but there is a place where i'm willing to draw the line and drawing the line would definitely be uh, casualties of people who are not involved and also uh, private property of people who are not involved, yeah. especially people who come from uh, the same, if not similar groups to, to uh, the one that was victimized, specifically when George Floyd was profiled and murdered. Um, that Black said, businesses. on one hand, a lot of folks are, they, you know, they've lost their businesses, they lost their savings, they lost everything. On the other hand, just by burning down that police substation in Minneapolis, they achieved that all four of those police officers did end up getting arrested, did end up getting criminal charges filed against them. And then you've got multiple states that have accelerated legislation into the state legislatures that uh, are seeking to end qualified immunity or some kind yep. of ending or curbing of qualified immunity. And that would not have happened had the protesters not uh, torch what in my opinion was at the time a legitimate target especially since when it was actually torched and burning down everybody already been evacuated from that because the situation was getting too hairy just from there being so many protesters so if that is wrong if that is wrong then we need to seriously revisit what we are teaching our children about these revolutionary war heroes and the boston tea party and all these mm -hmm. other little things that we do plays about in elementary school and we have a little cupcake afterward. If burning down a police station that is part of an institution that is protecting murderers from accountability is wrong, I don't want to be right. So that being said, <laughs> we also saw the positive in L.A. where the mayor has said that instead of going forward with 
the major police expansion uh, budgetary plan that that money is going to be used to address concerns with the black community. Another positive change. But Zach, I want to I want to put you on the spot because there is one sort of gray area here. <clears throat> there, one of the things that I've heard with some of the looting is that the businesses being targeted were those that were sponsoring the police that had you know donated to police charities which we know means that they're sponsoring by buying extra protection i like my i don't know you're you know in california the 1199 foundation is the california highway patrol my parents joined so they could have a sticker on their car and a license plate frame so they ever got pulled over you know with their with their driver's license they could they had this little badge this little badge thing that they could they could hand the cop with so do you think it's okay then to to uh, to 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 use force to to say no your business is being used to fund terrorism and violence that we're we're going to say we're not we're going to physically take your business away I don't know if I have an answer to that question yet because that is one hell of a gray area um, the one place where I can give you an answer is. I seriously doubt some of those businesses on Rodeo Drive were donating to the police foundations. Um, I don't know how many of these little Italian fashion outlets are, are involved mm. with making uh, donations to the police foundations. I know certain groups like the Church of Scientology make uh, uh, pretty sizable donations to different police booster funds, but I don't see anybody protesting um, in front of those facilities because you got the, the armed Scientology security and you know, members of the C organization will come out uh, in force with their weapons. And there's been a number of other businesses that have been looted that definitely have absolutely nothing to do with, with any of the police booster associations or the sure, 1199 sure. foundation. You know, just, it's a lot of local knuckleheads who are trying to get their, their due. And, and I'm actually glad you brought that up because that reminds me, I have read in uh, different reputable mainstream news outlets, um, about hard evidence about different groups of agitators, all of whom are trying to take advantage of these protests for their own agenda. Of uh, number one, we have seen uh, video footage in a couple of instances of a couple of really uh, uh, spirited police officers uh, hitting their own police vehicles, vandalizing their own vehicles, uh, and then trying to, ah. trying to you know, claim victim about it. We <laughs> have also flags, seen... We have also seen hard evidence of just a lot of lo uh, known local shitheads who are trying to, you know, just steal an Xbox. Um, and, you know, they've got a long, uh, a long rap sheet and they're just taking advantage of this. Very similar to a lot of looting in 1992. Uh, then you've got the Boogaloo boys walking around. As much as they deny it, you know, yeah, I'm willing to bet 90% of people walk around in Hawaiian shirts uh, and little straw hats with, with their automatic rifles are, if not white supremacists, probably far-right extremists who are secretly hoping that this is going to be the revolution, this is going to be the start of the boogaloo. And then on top of them, you've got the actual communists. Like, I'm not trying to be some right-winger saying, you know, the liberals or the left or Democrats in general are communists. No, I'm talking about the group of people who actually sit down and study Karl Marx those people have been very heavily uh, taking advantage of these protests. And oh, yeah. when I, when I talk about these things, I don't want to downplay the actual motive for the protest because that is a separate thing. And that is a very legitimate, um, very real issue that, that, that shows a lot of the rot going on in the system. But on top of that, you've got rogue police officers, or maybe they're not rogue. Maybe they're taking orders. Mm -hmm. You've got local criminals and you've got actual communists who, who are trying to make this the big revolution. And if they can't make this a revolution, then they're going to go with the same playbook that they uh, were, were doing about six, seven months ago in Latin America. Some of you guys might remember in the news, there were huge protests that first erupted all over Chile, yeah. then they erupted all over Ecuador, then they went to Colombia. Um, there were different protests going on in Bolivia, but there was massive protesting and rioting happening in multiple Latin American nations all around the same time and in every one of those protests there was some kind of a local grievance a very legitimate grievance that was being exploited um in chile uh, whether you agree with it or not, or not a lot of people had a grievance with the cost of living because despite chile being a free market miracle the government still has monopolies on certain things such as the transportation sector 
uh, the government sets prices for the train tickets and the prices that the government was setting, um, you know, a lot of people felt was generally too high and unfair to them. Uh, maybe if there had been more privatization and competition, there would have been lower prices, but that just wasn't the case. And, and despite these very legitimate grievances of people complaining about the government making the cost of living out of their reach, you had these groups of agitators that are literal members of the Chilean Communist Party um, and then other members of Cuban intelligence, members of the Maduro regime, different paramilitary groups from Venezuela who were sent to these countries posing as social agitators, specifically trying to get people to burn down more infrastructure, trying to get people to burn down private property, trying to make more people poor. That, that's the whole thing. If they cannot make this a, an overtly communist state, then they still want to uh, make socialism happen by causing so much destruction and causing such a setback to the economy that the society is poorer and that everybody needs things like stimulus checks. You already have people really pushing for two or three stimulus checks. Now, I'm not going to go into the morality or the philosophy of the stimulus checks, whether that's good or bad. We can agree that just objectively, a lot of people, because of a number of reasons, are economically screwed. And you know they've already decided they really need that money. So we already see ourselves creeping more into socialism. And that was just from COVID. That was not from, you know, on top of all the, the unemployment from, from COVID and, and, and that economic quarantine that we put on ourselves, you've got people actually destroying the place where people work so that you know, if they're not properly insured or if there's some kind of contingency that insurance doesn't cover or if they were not able to insure because of zoning laws or you know, even if they, they are insured, it's going to be six to 12 months before the insurance company even starts making those reimbursement payments. How are they supposed to pull you know, a million dollars out of their butt for capital to start getting a new space? Um, to get new equipment for whatever it was that your business was, um, to pay people the back wages, you know, that you weren't able to pay them from, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. the point well, is, you're, is you're, to make us poor so that we need the government. Yes, and that's what absolutely. the police and the communists agree on. And, and that's good because the police are almost universally right wingers. That is what the right wing police and what the actual American mm -hmm. communists agree on is that they want more government. They just want it in their image and not a government that actually serves you and me. Uh, but what Latin America was suffering in part from, from Cuban and Venezuelan interference, that is absolutely happening right here. Absolutely. Some of the people involved, for example, uh, Max Blumenthal, who uh, poses as a journalist, but uh, his really, you know, his little piece in history was he was part of the embassy protection collective that occupied the Venezuelan embassy on behalf of Maduro. Now, I completely understand if you're going to protest against the United States deploying troops and start another war with another country, I completely understand that. There's a difference between that and occupying another country's foreign embassy uh, because you like their dictator, because uh, despite mountains and mountains of evidence of massive human rights abuses, uh, you know, he is part of your political religion, so he must be protected. Um, so uh, uh, for most people who, who don't know, in the Venezuelan context, a collective is specifically a hybrid organization that is both a social mission and a paramilitary group. So if somebody makes like the, you know, the San Jose collective in California and they made it in the Venezuelan model, then some of the people working in that collective would run a soup kitchen that only people who vote correctly have access to. And then like the young men in that collective would be the hired muscle. So when people from the opposing parties come out into the streets to protest against the regime, then the hired muscle gets their guns and they get on their motorcycle. And by the way, there's gun control in Venezuela, universal gun control, unless you're one of the government's paramilitary groups or just a criminal gang. Uh, those are the only people with guns. So the collectives will get out there and they start enforcing. Well, they can't have guns if they're going to go against DC police and the Secret Service that is a battle that they know they cannot win and they will look really bad internationally. But again, most people don't know what a collective is in the Venezuelan context. So you've got these code pink people, you know, and, and these PSL people on all these other American Leninists, these American tankies, people who say Lenin and Stalin did nothing wrong talking about, Oh yeah, we uh, were fighting for peace. We don't want America to start another war. Um, if we hold this building for, for this, 
this foreign president, somehow this is going to stop uh, the U.S. government from sending the 101st Airborne Division uh, to Caracas. Now, a lot of people are automatically are asking, what is a gringo like me doing involved with Venezuela? And and that's absolutely a justified question to ask. For Who's starters, I'm helping... CIA? Yeah, I'm working for the CIA. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> there have been some really difficult days of activism mm-hmm. and, and trying to help folks in Venezuela and humanitarian fires. That sometimes I say to myself, I freaking wish the CIA was involved. Because if this was a CIA op, it would be over and done with already. They either would have bungled it so colossally and their fingerprints would be everywhere, or they would have won. When you look at the history of CIA ops, as harebrained as some of the schemes are, most of the time, they freaking win. Like, Fidel Castro was the one dude that they were not able to actually kill. Um, everybody else, you know, they, they, they pretty much got him. So, yeah, uh, not a CIA op, but I'm involved because first, people were for help. Um, I originally got involved in Latin American politics in general because the folks asking me for help were Cuban libertarians. Three years ago, and you were uh, involved in my life when a lot of this, these events were, were unfolding before my eyes. A couple of libertarians in February 2017 were arrested by Cuban state security, which uh, it's the political police. Like if the FBI and the NSA was one organization, that would be state security. And by the way, for, for all the people wearing their Che Guevara t-shirts out there, state security was founded by Che Guevara. So Che Guevara is the J. Edgar Hoover of Cuba, not just a guy who selflessly gave to him gave of himself, you know, for revolutions abroad. He is absolutely the J. Edgar Hoover of modern Cuba. And that police state that exists today, he was the architect. Uh, Raul Castro was a very happy enforcer, but all of that was Che's baby. Anyway, state security arrested these guys for having the wrong book. There was a Mises Cuba book club in Havana. I didn't even know that, that these people were reading Austrian economics in Havana. But, you know, folks were interested in things like freedom and capitalism and private property and all these other little taboo subjects that you're not allowed to talk about in Cuba. So just from Google searches over a while and educated themselves, these people found out about libertarianism. So next thing you know, uh, 2015, 2016, there's a small group of people in a little house in Havana that are reading uh, Friedrich Hayek. They're reading Ludwig von Mises. They're reading Murray Rothbard. They're just dabbling into all these different voluntarist, libertarian, classical liberal, free market, uh, maximum freedom, limited government style books. And that kind of activism, even though it was just people meeting in a house, it got the attention of the political police because anytime people are congregating in a house, yeah, there are snitches all over that society. In very hungry, poor societies, um, governments or local warlords are able to keep control by just controlling the food supply. So there are people that tell, hey, you know, so-and-so Mary, she had three or four people uh, at her house this week that have never been here before. You know, people snitch on each other all the time. Well, that's exactly, exactly. I, just, I, gotta, I gotta interrupt because you, you made something like really important occur to me here. In terms of, like, just to remind my fellow Americans about the, what, what would you just said, how food is used as a, a tool of control. And oh, yeah. here... We have been uh, we, we've been talking about how great it is that in the United States we have food banks and pantries and community service groups that make sure like we have plenty of food. People don't starve even when we can't put the money into the food industry that we normally could because of the forced unemployment crisis. But this makes us especially vulnerable to that next level of manipulation because if all the food comes through central control points or anybody who's not you know, getting government approved money and able to shop at grocery stores, everybody who's dependent, they're able to be manipulated into being uh, much more submissive. Yes, this is very true. And while we should celebrate that so many local governments and private businesses and individual donors want to finance food banks so that people who are truly desperate are able to get something, the idea that food banks the existence of food banks and people being in a position to need to go to these locations as an end of itself, um, as something that we as society should be aiming for or, or accepting as this is the way, you know, this is perfectly okay with the situation it ought to be. That's not acceptable. We should celebrate charity. We should strive to be, to take part in charity. We should never strive to 
put people in a position or teach people to be in a position where they are dependent on charity. Because, for example, a lot of homeless people have learned that they can't really go to a lot of churches and missions. There's a, a, a in, in Los Angeles where I stay and work a lot of the time, there are a number of homeless missions that are really su- su- successful, a lot of faith based ones. Some of these have lines going out around the block and around the corner, and others don't get a lot of traffic. The ones that don't get a lot of traffic are the ones that have strings attached. Yeah, sure, you, you know, we'll give you food or we'll let you stay at the shelter, but you have to come to X number of church services, or you have to do this, or you have to be baptized, or you have to, um, you know, you have to join us and, and do a little bit of volunteer work at, at this religious event. Um, that kind of bartering, you know, making that there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But the fact is, a lot of people are not interested in, in stepping outside their, their principles or their morals. And that's a really mild example, because that's a voluntary example. Um, nobody's making any laws that say you have to go eat at a, a faith based food bank. But when you get to a situation where the government is having more and more control, and it's a crisis situation, um, then it becomes a lot more problematic, because well, then you can only go and get food between certain hours, and then you have to wait in these long lines, and, and you're then you losing might need productivity. A ID, and then you might need to yeah, you got to get a national ID. So what we've seen in Venezuela, to show that you're not using the food for illegal purposes or to fuel riots. So Zach, I got I got to throw three more things at you before we wrap this up. Pretty okay. From here. Uh, first, what is the situation with LP Cuban Venezuela now in light of the coronavirus crisis? And are there any uh, protests related to the George Floyd murder in those countries right now? In Cuba, uh, it's difficult. It's extremely difficult in both countries. Uh, I never thought I would say this, but they're actually a little bit better off in Cuba because while the economy is bad and it's getting worse, it's not as bad as Venezuela. A lot of people have been staying inside, but there's rampant mass unemployment in Cuba anyway. Whereas in Venezuela, the coronavirus pandemic has really put a stop on life. Uh, the regime has used that to their, to their power. And a lot of our libertarian brothers are having a difficult time because uh, with the, the chronic gasoline shortages, even before the U.S. government started putting sanctions, gas output was like 5% of what it was 10 years ago, just because the communists absolutely... Uh, uh, ruined their economy. So these folks are either waiting in line for three days to get gas or they're just not getting gas. And they're also not getting health care. The government claims that less than a thousand people have gotten coronavirus. It's actually been um, about a million people are infected with coronavirus and about 15,000 people have died. And there are certain parts of, of Venezuela, just like in China, just like in Wuhan, certain parts of Caracas, uh, Aragua, and so on, other population centers where the crematoriums are going 24 seven and they're occupied by the military and there's a complete media blackout. But that's the biggest problem right there with no gasoline. People can't transport food. There is already a food shortage, but the food shortage is worse and they're blaming it on Donald Trump. And what's extremely frustrating is where Venezuela was about 10 years ago is where the United States is right now. And that's the part that's concerning to me. Uh, The one great equalizer, in my opinion, is that in this country, we still have the Second Amendment. And we can also see the difference in how the police and mass have treated protesters who were unarmed versus protesters who were armed. You know, nobody wants to start a a big, massive shootout um, if you're a police officer. A lot of them project force, um, you know, a lot of them really are good people, but the ones projecting force, they're not used to people fighting back or they're not used to people fighting back with equal force. So they're just not going to start that. They don't have that in Venezuela, which is why the National Guard does shoot people. One of our libertarian brothers, his name is Daniel from Caracas. He got shot protesting in 2014. He was a civilian. Um, a good uh, friend of mine, Franklin, who lives in Salt Lake City today, he was in medical school, and just for, for expressing a different opinion to the regime, he got expelled and charged with terrorism. And now his, his family back in the country, um, they haven't been able to, to get outside their house really and, and get groceries because of the pandemic, because of the quarantine, because the regime's police or paramilitaries will just shoot you if you violate the quarantine. 
and that's the end of the story. And, and that's what a lot of people are facing down there. But um, it's, it's really frustrating helping those people fight that tyranny down there because they, they ask for that help. It is difficult doing that and then seeing things over here starting to take a turn in that way. I don't want to be a exactly, pessimist. I don't exactly. want to be a Debbie Downer. But we're, we are at that crossroads. That, that's where we are. Oh, so I don't know. I, I hadn't considered that historical comparison before that Venezuela 10 years ago, where America is now, and you go, oh, yeah, that too. And you go, oh, the Roman Empire. And you go, oh, the French Empire. Right, think of it. Uh, 15, 20 years ago, Venezuelans used to come to America to buy cheap stuff. <laughs> okay. So, Zach, if you don't mind, we're going to open this up to the comments. Are, are there any questions specifically for Zach or about Latin America, LP Venezuela, LP Cuba issues, anything he's, he's raised so far? Great to check in with someone Fire who's got off. his finger on uh, the pulse of a, seg a segment of the world that we don't get to cover as much as I'd normally like to. All right. From uh, YouTube, Scuffed World Order, right? So, basically, this guy is saying... State bad, CIA good. I, I don't think that's what Zach is saying. You want to no, clarify? I don't think he picked up on the sarcasm. That was a joke. I wish the CIA was involved. Uh, overall, that was a comment on the CIA has actually been absent in Venezuela. The Cuban intelligence agencies have been all over it. Um, what I'm going to say to that guy is a lot of people in the United States get CIA blinders. I am not denying anything that the CIA has done. Pinochet, uh, Dominican Republic, Iran, 1953, Guatemala, uh, Indonesia, all the other ones, I am not denying anything because that would be wrong. That said, they're not the only bad guys. We are living in a Game of Thrones world where there are multiple corrupt kingdoms, um, all of them trying to take over each other, and the idea that the Venezuela embassy protectors were stopping regime change from illegally taking over the embassy... Well, you, that's very interesting. Illegally taking over, the law is dictated by the different legislative organizations, that being your city council, your state legislature, or the United States Congress, and the Constitution. Uh, the president gets to be the chief diplomat. He gets to decide who is legally a government of a particular country. He decided uh, that the Venezuelan National Assembly was... Um, the, the guy elected by the Venezuela National Assembly, Juan Guaido, was the guy. So if you want to respect Venezuelan law, under Hugo Chavez's constitution, Juan Guaido really is the legitimate president. Now, he is a garbage president. He is a liability for Venezuelan freedom. And he is also, in my opinion, an auxiliary puppet working for the Maduro regime. But under Venezuelan law, he's the guy. Under American law, the president gets to decide who is the guy. So legally, the embassy protectors were trespassing against a recognized government's embassy. So, hey, CJ, Next put question. that put that last comment uh, up again. Now, the the, <laughs> the one about there we go from Jeremy Gooding. I think I'd rather attend a timeshare seminar than utilize faith based food lines. So, and with that's that why a lot of people <laughs> just choose to go hungry. Well, no. To be fair, now, now, to be fair, I don't. I, at Jeremy's point, that's a great one. I don't like the wording because it's not fair to so many faith-based food lines that are pure charity without the evangelism. And yeah, and, the and ones with the really long lines, those, those are those are the ones that do it with no strings attached, and that's why right. they have such a high demand. Yeah. Yes, and and support those people who as an expression of their faith, are doing critical work to help their fellow human beings. And with that, Zach, I got one yeah, last tough question. Yeah, I got, I got one last tough question for you. Okay. Bring it back to the, the United States and the looting and the riots here. One of the things you said suggested that you, you wouldn't support, for example, uh, you know, the, the young black men we see in Minneapolis looting a target. And actually, one of my favorite memes that came out of this, there's a picture. It's like, you know, it's a Target checkout area. And there's like, a, a, you know, half a dozen black dudes with their arms full, like running out with stuff. And then it zooms in. And then there's this one white dude in the back corner with a giant Lego set in his arms, wearing, wearing a mask. And you can just barely tell that he's white. And you go, and the, the caption is something like, got to give props to the white dude 
braving looting and riots to steal Legos from Target, right? But the, the, the question that's not that has little to do with the question I'm getting at here, Zach, which is that for someone who's in the United States and is unemployed, uh, possibly a young black man who goes, well, now it's in my face that the system is going to murder people like me and let police officers get away with it. And there, I am shut down. I, I am not allowed to work my job as a waiter or a server or a bartender anymore. I am in a forced unemployment right now. And yet Target is allowed to stay open. Target is benefiting in this crisis. Target is the one business in my neighborhood that is allowed to do business while the rest of, rest of us are shut down by force by government. And they're paying taxes. And those taxes are going to pay the police that are terrorizing my community. Am I justified in stealing some shit back from this evil system? And if that's the case, doesn't it mean that people in Venezuela and Cuba standing up have the uh, should, should be doing the same thing and have the same right to say, you know what, if you're going to put me in this kind of economic desperation by force, then I have to use force to steal back what has been taken from me for my quality of life. Is that justified? In Venezuela, it almost would have been um, because the government has taken so much of the, like, actually looted so much of the, the wealth from the people directly in the form of, like, 80 to 90 percent taxes plus expropriation, which is what they call eminent domain down there. Just for the public good, you know, your farm, your ranch, your factory, poof. Um, is it different in you know, the United States of those by properties. being one degree milder? <sighs> Well, your question, you were asking from the point of view of a young American black man. All the American black men that I know personally in my life as friends whom I deeply respect, whose tables I have sat down at, if they truly respect their mothers, then they would not be participating in those looting sessions, the rioting. They know, however, that a lot of their neighbors don't care about well, what, what, what their mothers loot, taught them. Loot or your family goes hungry, Zach. Um, if it's a case of stealing food, I don't know. Uh, well, loot, uh, once loot it gets or your to, family, but loot or your family doesn't get to wear you decent clothes. Uh, decent clothes. You know, not really concerned. Food, I can understand. Loot I'm not going to condone it, but I'm not going to condemn loot, it either. Loot, or um, you but that's the question: Are people looting food, or are people looting PlayStations? That is, that is the million dollar question. So, um, before anybody passes judgment on somebody who is participating in the looting, I'm going to ask them right there: Are you stealing diapers for your baby, or are you stealing Blu-ray movies? Well, what, what difference does it make? It's something that you can have without the system. You if it's something for right. more diapers. No, no, I mean I what yeah, what if they're stealing a PlayStation so they can sell it for diapers? You get a lot more diapers. I don't know. At a certain and, and, point. And, you know, what if you're stealing a PlayStation, but you know that this is a system that has stolen way, way, way more from you. We have another uh, super chat popped up here from Gangster Talk. How much is a short term girlfriend in Venezuela? They should probably ask the FARC and the ELN. They are the number one traffickers of Venezuelan women. Is there no legal prostitution? Legal, no. Mm, that's unfortunate. Uh, it's Venezuela rampant because people got to eat. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's mostly the regime people who can afford to hire their services. All right, so back to the, the challenging question here. What if you're going to steal a PlayStation? Because you have your basic needs met, but you're working your ass off, and you know that you'd be able to afford a dozen PlayStations if it wasn't for government. Okay. If you are an oppressed person who is fighting in complete crisis mode to stay alive and keep their family alive, and you got to do whatever you got to do you know, to keep your family alive, um, I'm not going to say that you have the right to steal you have the right to do what you got to do to keep your family alive while realizing that does not cancel out other people's right to protect their business because they need their business or they need their job so that they can continue to put food on their family's table. 
So that's the thing. I mean, uh, that, that's the best answer I can give you. Yes, you have a right in an absolute societal breakdown crisis mode when there are no other alternatives. That's the key thing right there. No other alternatives. Then you have the right to do what you got to do to keep your family alive while realizing the person on the other side of the equation, whatever it is that you're planning to hit, those people also have the same right to fight for their life and for their family. And realize if you're gonna if you're gonna use that method to resolve your problems, just understand um, other people can use that method too, and it's not always gonna work out your way. Live by the sword. Well, Zach, I really appreciate that's an interesting place to draw the line, and I appreciate your consideration today and and connecting this and helping us zoom out to a little bit more of an international perspective today. How do people get in touch with you? What websites do you want to plug? cubanlibertarians.org cubanlibertarians.org that's the Mises Mambi Institute that's our think tank and our uh, uh, activism nonprofit. people can find a lot of news and information generally about what's happening with the libertarians behind the Iron Curtain in Cuba and Venezuela we got news articles we've got uh, images we've got videos in English and in Spanish a lot of really cool whoa shoot yeah. sorry my tripod collapsed <laughs> anyway, that is God telling me to wrap it up. <laughs> but CubanLibertarians.org, great website to go to. And right thank on. you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you for joining us. We'll make sure we get those links in the notes. Zach Foster, ladies and gentlemen.